part of what you're doing here and the shift you heard tonight. I thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, for this message that you give Pastor Dallas to share with us in part two of the Faithful series, and ask that you would bless him. Lord, open up our ears and our hearts and our minds to receive what you're trying to speak to us tonight. I pray people would hear your voice clearly. Um, <laughs> we just give it all to you, Lord. We say it's all for you. So I pray you would be glorified.
he did some wonderful things. And we're going to see some things he did on in that. We talk about his purpose. He had a purpose even before he was born. And every one of you in here have a purpose. Everybody has a purpose. You might not feel like it tonight. You might not feel like it two weeks ago. But you got a purpose, believe it or not. So look at your neighbor and say, you got a purpose. You really do. You got a purpose. Okay? We all have a purpose. So tonight we're going to go a little bit further. Tonight we're going to look at the scripture. Matthew chapter 3. We're going to look at just a couple verses. Put our scripture up there. So listen. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Now, John the Baptist clothed himself with what? Who knows? Raise your hand. Rabbit. Not rabbit hair, no. What did he cover himself with? Any student, no. Okay, that's what we're talking about. I'm surprised, actually. He covered himself, no, the leaves was out of the knee. He covered himself with camel hair. That's what he was covered with. He covered himself with camel hair, had a leather belt around his waist. And what did John the Baptist eat? Honey and what? Milk. That's Canaan land. Milk is honey. Oh, milk and honey in Canaan land. Honey and locusts. Elliot, I'm sorry, Elliot. I don't stand before you raise your hand there. He ate honey and locusts. I was like to have a guy of insects. Maybe they were shots of cover, would you like it better? So that's what he ate, honey and insects. That was his diet, covered in camel's hair. So now we look at his life in Matthew chapter 3. Shh, listen, nothing. Now he's older, now he's an adult. He's not in his mama's womb anymore. He's older and he's now beginning to fulfill that purpose and that plan, what God had him to do, what his purpose was for him to do. And his, we look at his ministry and his life, his Christ-centered ministry, everything that he did. We're going to talk about faceless, faceless, faceless tonight in the next couple of weeks. We're going to try to understand what exactly that means. What it means to be faceless. We've all seen commercials that are well made. But not clear on the product they're advertising. Have you ever seen a commercial and you watch it and then it's over and you're like, what in the world are they even talking about? I'm confused on what I was, what they're trying to sell me, what I'm trying to buy or what. So if it's not pointing to something, the question is in that commercial the advertisement, is it even doing its job? So we're going to look at a little clip of, a, of an advertisement that's unclear on maybe what they're selling, what they're trying to get you to buy. If you're going to buy it, what it's going to cost you or what? We don't even know what they're trying to get you into. Is it a scam? Is it multi-level art? What in the world is it in this commercial? Let's take a look. Either way, I was going to try 
when a church called me and asked me to come speak, I would never say, how big is the church? How many people is going to be there? How big is my offering going to be? I took it as the Lord opened the doors. He wanted me to go somewhere. The Lord would provide it. He always did provide for me. So when a church called and asked me to come speak, I would work into my schedule, whatever I could put it, and say, I'm available, I'll be there. They could tell me I'd get the address. I would travel to the church. Well, I traveled to a church kind of near my hometown, um, back in that area in the Lord, North Carolina. The pastor called me to come preach. I knew of the church name. I had no idea how many people were there. First, there was going to be a Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night revival. So I pull up 30 minutes before church starts, and I'm the only one in the parking lot. I mean, I beat the pastor there. There's nobody there. There's no praise team practicing, nobody worshiping, nobody getting ready. So I'm there, and I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at my clock. I'm like, this is the right church. I mean, there's the name, and that's all good, and it's, you know, Pastor So-and-So's church, and I know this is it. So about 10 till, car rolls up. Pastor pulls up. She gets out of the car. Her husband gets out of the car. Her, the pastor's mother gets out of the car, and the pastor's son gets out of the car. I'm sitting there going over my notes. I'm prepared, man. I got all my sermons ready. I know when I'm preaching, God's giving me the word for, the, for Friday night, for Saturday night, for Sunday morning, Sunday night. Nobody else pulls up. So at 7 o'clock, it's time to start. So I'm thinking, well, okay then. I'm going to go in here, these four people, and I'm going to preach. I was kind of expecting a few more than that. This big old building, twice the size of this facility right here. So I go in, it's the four of them. They all sit on the front row. Two right there, two right there. The pastor and his, her husband's on that side, and the son and the grandma's on this side. But you know what? God's going to be a word anyway. And so I didn't change my word. The pastor kind of sung a song with some cassette tapes, two or three. I got up and preached my heart out. I knew what God had given me, and I questioned it the whole time. Because he, he gave me a message about giving your heart to the Lord. And I thought, man, I got the pastor. Her husband, and grandma, been in the church for 50 years, and pastor's son is the pastor's kid, right? So I preached my heart. I thought, well, the Lord's like, nope, you're going to preach that. And I'm thinking, I need to preach something else. I need to preach something else. The Lord's like, nope, you're going to preach the message I told you to preach. I preached that message. I preached it like I was preaching to 500 people. I give the altar call. Pastor's son gets up, comes to the front, all his eyes out, gives his heart to the Lord. Next night, I come back. I get there at 7, 6.30, 30 before church starts. I'm the first one there. I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. Tim Teal, pastor pulls up in her van. Pastor gets out. Pastor's husband gets out. Grandma gets out. Son gets out. Now the older daughter gets out. Thank you. You're kidding me. Nobody else shows up Saturday night. I got a salvation message again. I was expecting 25. I mean, you know, somebody got saved last night. There's going to be 30 people show up tonight. There's five people when I said before. Like, I got to preach something different. I mean, the kid got saved last night. And it's, you know, the Lord said, no, I don't want you to preach. I'm going to preach tonight. I get up there and I preach like I'm preaching to 500 people. And I preach, get saved, get your heart right. Jesus is coming. I give you all the call. The 20 year old pastor's daughter comes to the front, crying around, and gives her heart to the Lord. It's Sunday morning. I'm expecting, I think it'll be six people in the morning, ready to go. I get there every morning. I'm the first one there again, 30 minutes before church starts. But this time, instead of six people, there were 12 people. And those that had gotten saved and invited their friends. The Sunday morning service of 12 people. I just preached to like 800 the week before. Okay? It's a big difference to preaching to 800 and coming and preaching to four. There's 12 people there. Pastor, her husband, grandma, and the two that got saved in the last two nights. Okay, there's seven other people there. The Lord's giving me a message to pray or to preach for salvation. I'm thinking, God, you're kidding me, Lord. These are Sunday morning church folk. They all probably saved. I know the two got saved this week, and I'm, I'm assuming the pastor saved and her husband and grandma. I mean, Grandma's the clerk, the organ, and the secretary, and everything else. And the folder, you know, so I mean, she's got to be safe. <laughs> so I preach my heart out. I give an altar call. 
five of those people that came that Sunday morning come to the front, crying their eyes out, give their heart to Jesus. Sunday night, same deal. But now we've got about 25 people there. And all those that got saved there, they've got our all back. And they've all brought somebody with them. And the Lord says, I want you to preach on salvation. Just like I told you, you have the message, you have the scripture. You've got to give it to you several weeks ago. I want you to preach it. I preach it again. And about six or seven people that night come to the front, crying their eyes out, give their heart to Jesus. What we do in ministry should point to Jesus. How do you define success? I define, when I look back over four years of revivals, is that revival one of my most successful revivals? Because of the impact it had on that church and the number of people that were there and the number of people that got saved. I don't look back and say, oh, when I preached to the church that had a thousand, that was a great revival because there were so many people there and we're all worshiping the Lord and what a spirit. I don't look back at the revival that was scheduled for a week, but it went nine weeks and I preached every night for nine weeks straight to the same church in Southern North Carolina. I don't look back and say, that was the most successful revival. I look back at the one that I would have never at many points in my life defined that revival as being a success until I look at the dynamic of what God did. So how do you define success in what you do? It's not in how many people are around you. It's not if everybody gives you applause. It's if you follow what the Lord is speaking to you and what he wants you to do. We are faceless so that he may truly be seen. Wherever you minister, make sure what you do points others to Jesus and not yourself. So, we've got several people here that do things in ministry in this church that some of you never know. You don't ever even recognize them. Callie Roberts, stand up. Callie serves in a, in a class on Sunday mornings. Everybody that comes into the church on Sunday morning. They don't know she's serving in there. Maybe the parents that drop off their kid and pick up, they say, hey, they, they know Cali. Those handful of parents serving in that classroom. But like high school, I'm gonna be, can I be real for a little bit? Mm -hmm. High school or maybe they go to Sunday school and probably think, where's Cali? She's not in Sunday school today. Go she's laying out again. I don't ahead. ever see Cali. I thought I saw her, but she must be just sitting in the sanctuary. I want to come over here, Mr. James, tonight. Well, James was here, but he's not. He's there <laughs> Not the kind of talking about this morning here in high school, a different kind of party. <laughs> but she's not skipping out of Sunday school. She's over here serving. But we don't see it. Maddie reverse end up. Maddie serves in children's churches. She runs the uh, audio visual stuff. And, and people get to watch that stuff. And it's put on YouTube and it's shared. And the parents get to see the service and see their kids interact and all that. And they never know that it's Maddie that's doing the video work on that. Our ministry is not seen. Joshua and Joshua in the back stand up. They, I mean, they like hidden in the back. <laughs> but if it wasn't for Joshua Robinette, when I say next slide in my scripture, boom, boom, they wouldn't go up there. I mean, I could get a clicker and I've done that and I did it in my last church and I've had it and I got it on my phone and then it always glitches. You're like, boop, and then it doesn't flip, boop, and it doesn't flip, boop, 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 it jumps three slides ahead. And everybody's reading three slides ahead of where you're at. You need somebody at the computer solves those glitches 99% of the time. Josh, if I had run into sound, I mean, look, let's be real. Musicians are divas. <laughs> Aren't they being? Aren't they being? They are. <laughs> they are. This is too loud. Turn me down. Turn me up. I can't hear this. The monitor, the speaker, the house. Josh, fix this. I'm squealing. I'm screeching. And Josh is just right there doing his thing, man. He makes everybody sound good. <laughs> Say what? It's an artist. Yeah, it's an artist. It's artistry. Make you sound good. I mean, you can't be up there playing and then run back and turn your little thing and come back. And I'm sure you musicians, when you've done that in a church before, and that ain't fun, is it? Is it, Dad? I've seen you do it. It's not fun, is it? To run back and turn stuff and then run back up there. No. You've got to have this person back there serving and doing and doing things that, that you don't even know how it's happening, but it's happening and it's working. These are Ben, stand up. Do you hear yes. Ben? Stand up. <laughs> you can you. He gets back there and he's learning, he's serving too. You really can't see him back there and he's back in the, <laughs> in the booth in the sanctuary. These guys are serving in the sanctuary too. But you don't know it. Joshua, 
does the live feed for Facebook sometimes. It does the sound. And all these people tuned in and hundreds of people watched the live Facebook feed for Grace on Sunday mornings throughout the week. But it wouldn't work if he wasn't doing the sound for it. It's, but nobody knows. And it's, it doesn't say, you know, we, we try to, when y'all do videos or stuff, we try to credit y'all and say who's this and who's that and give y'all props. We want to encourage y'all. But we don't say, and Joshua Wood did the volume of the day. <laughs> Brought to you by Joshua Wood and Grace Church of Fredericksburg. We don't say that. But he does it and he makes it happen. How many others of you serve like in a Sunday school class where nobody sees? Anybody else? Stand up if you do. Yeah. People don't know. Gabe Johnson, stand up. But I bet the parents that drop their kids off know. You drop your kids off any of these teachers? Um, sometimes. Like, so. Allison Marshall serves almost every Sunday. Allison Marshall serves. Any, here. In any classroom, anywhere, Allison Marshall serves. Serving, serving, and, and, and you can sit down. We are faceless so that he may truly be seen. When you serve in that area, you are serving for purpose. You are doing a purpose. You're providing ministry to people and kids, and you're raising them, and you're growing them. Don't ever look at your class and say, I've only got four kids. And Callie's got 15 kids. Trust me, Callie, wish she had four. You had 15. <laughs> Don't ever look at the number of what's going on or, or if a parent is all super excited and, and, and says how amazing you are and wonderful you are. Maybe you stand at your little door on them and her kids keep picking up the parents like, where's my kid? And they take the kid, where's my kid? And then you look over there and, and you see Megan in her classroom and her parents like, Megan, you're so wonderful. You do such a wonderful job with my kids. They love you. And you got like boogers on you and smile and all this stuff. And you're like, oh. But you know what? And diarrhea. <laughs> he was like, I don't want to touch nobody's hand. I just need to go to the bathroom and wash my hand. And I'm hungry and I'm tired and these kids are screaming and I got a headache. But you know what? You're making a difference in those kids' lives. You're impacting those kids' lives in ways that you'll never know. You'll never know until one day when they're older and they look back and speak to you when they become a teen and you're a young adult and you're married and you're 30 and they say, Man, I remember you watching me. You were taking care of me and you help me, and these kids will attach themselves to you as they grow up, and you grow up in this church in years to come, and they'll look to you. You're doing ministry. You don't do it. So the parents will tell you how wonderful you are. You do it because you're providing a ministry to those kids on whatever area you serve in. You don't run the sound of the slides so because you expect every time you do it, somebody to tell you how wonderful you are because you, that might not happen. I don't preach and pastor teens because the parents are going to email me on Monday and say, I'm just an amazing youth pastor. But this don't happen to you. That's not why. I learned that a long time ago. My inbox doesn't get flooded with teens on Sunday night and Monday morning saying, Pastor Dallas, that message just it changed my life. It wrecked me. I, you know, I don't, I don't get that all the time. I don't get a bunch of those every single Sunday night. That's not why I do it. I do it because it's what I'm called to do. It's a purpose. And you have a calling. And you have a purpose. And you were to do it and be faceless and not worry about what everybody else is saying or seeing, but as long as he sees it, and you're being successful. Look at the neighbor and say, are you faceless? <laughs> some of you answered that the wrong way, I guess, because some of you are laughing at all of us. <laughs> all right, listen. You all have a ministry. A ministry at school, home, youth group. What are your motivations in your ministry where you do it? What motivates you to do what you do? So I want to do this illustration. Ben, come over here real quick. I need to, I need to, to stand behind it. The big man. <laughs> Grab the legs so they don't fold under. Just move it forward about two feet. Grab the legs. It's all in the details, folks. If this goes, collapses, the bed's Thank you, Big Ben. Everybody say thank you, Big Ben. Thank you, Big Ben. That's the mistake. Everybody start calling him Big Ben. So, guys, we want our life to have an impact. Who in here wants your life to have an impact? Raise your hand. We'll raise both of mine. I want my life to have an impact. I don't want to just go through life and it not impact people. So, this, this milk 
And if you want to take a swallow to make sure it's not something special, I'll let you drink it. Okay, this is actually organic milk from Weber, so it's very good. Okay, I promise. You learned it's milk? Are you? Smell it and tell it's milk. Can't smell milk? Yes, you can smell milk. represents your life, okay? So in our life, we want to have impact, right? We want
And it's like we get stuck. And it's like I want to impact, but nothing happens. And I'm, I'm in this challenge, and I'm pulled into this, and I'm pulled into that, and I'm making this mistake and that mistake, and I'm, I'm, my family seems to all be mad at me, you know, and, and like I, I can't seem to win anybody to Christ. I mean, my personal walk with Christ is just like in a mess. But see, the problem is, is we don't saturate ourselves with Jesus. This represents Jesus. So what we have to do is just completely saturate ourselves with Jesus Christ. completely saturate ourselves with Christ and then we go and try to impact people in the world. All of a sudden, we can see the impact that's happening in people making in their lives because we're saturated with His presence. And when we try to do it on our own, nothing happens. We can try
We have to decide what we're doing it for. See, what God wants from you, if an R gets up there and sings, if she sings better than you, you just need to worship more and say, I'm so proud of her. I'm so excited for her. I'm so proud of me. And look at that. That's right. He goes to my new room playing his guitar on that car. Like he just owns all the guitars. I want to come in playing just on this side and leave drone this side. <laughs> you need to work on that, okay? Please do on this side and leave on this side. <laughs> you need to be like, man, Chelsea can play the drums. Wow. Dave can play the drums. Wow. Man, I can play the piano. Just, you know, it just makes it look so easy. You should be excited. Not jealous. See, God, God doesn't give you jealousy. Christ isn't happy when you're jealous. Somebody teaches better than you. Maybe ask somebody to mentor how you teach, how you prepare, so you can get better to pull out the best that's in you. Because what you do is not for everybody else. It's for Him. And when you see somebody doing something and they do it well, Christ doesn't want you to be jealous. He wants you to be encouraging. He wants you to work harder at the gifts He's given you. If you want to play an instrument, talk to me. We'll get you hooked up. We'll have you learn an instrument. You're never going to learn it. By just watching somebody play and think, well, I wish I could play the drums. It don't work like that. You've got to put the time in. You've got to put the effort in. We are faceless so that he can be saved. His life, the life of John the Baptist, modeled the life of what it looked like to be faceless, to impact society. Judea and Jerusalem, they came from everywhere. They said, baptize me. They turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. You can impact your school, your neighbors, your family, your life personally can be impacted by Christ if you will saturate yourself with Jesus. You can be impacted. Everybody say I'm going to do it different. The Lord just popped this up in mind. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to ask anything. I'm not going to do mention anything I preached about. And say, maybe if you're thinking this, maybe if you're feeling that, I'm just going to say this. Because see, Aaron, Christ didn't beg me to preach his gospel. He didn't. He didn't. He whispered a still small voice to me one morning at the altar and said, preach my gospel. And then I was like, Sometimes I just get down and I just say, God, speak. Your servants. 